Hey guys. Today I'm going to talk about uh, a number of issues that um, are a little bit maybe off the beaten path for a natural resource economics course, but that I think are extremely important and um, and I hope to uh, hopefully inspire some of you guys to think more about the intersections of natural resources and race equity and environmental justice. So um, let's just think through how we can structure some of these really important ideas. So to start, I think it's helpful to recognize that um, classical economics, and especially the economics that you learn in your 101 classes, your undergraduate classes, uh, makes a lot of simplifications that uh, allow us to avoid any discussion about disparate impacts on different groups of people, um, any instances of racism, racism or discrimination, um, and part of that, as you hear about in the discussion from Marketplace that hopefully you've listened to already, uh, Gary Hoover talks about, there's a certain amount of kind of the basics that we just need to learn about the economic toolkit. Um, uh, it just so happens that those simplifications end up covering up a lot of the complications that are important to understanding uh, how discrimination enters the world, how it works, and what are the impacts on people and society at large. Um, so just as an example, here's your classic Econ 101 setup. We're talking about apples here, for example. And we have our traditional upward sloping supply curve, our downward sloping demand curve. And we assume that, you know, in our Econ 101 setting, a perfect competition world where we can achieve our equilibrium point where the price and the quantity sold on this Apple market are is where our supply and demand curves intersect. So hopefully that looks familiar to everybody. Um, and to motivate that result, there's actually a lot of assumptions we need to make um, that you may or may not remember all of the assumptions. They're very strong assumptions. Uh, we need, you know, approaching an infinite number of buyers and sellers on this market. All the products that we're selling on this market are exactly the same. Um, any buyer or seller can enter and exit the market freely. There's no environmental externalities or other types of externalities. There's no network effects, nothing that anyone does impacts what someone else in the market is doing. Everyone has perfect information about the market. We have perfect property rights and buyers and sellers are only defined by their willingness to pay and their willingness to accept in the market. There's no other characteristics that we're giving anyone. Um, and of course, under this type of scenario, we assume we can get our free market, our free perfectly competitive market can achieve a socially optimal outcome where we've maximized um, consumer surplus and producer surplus. So in our Econ 101 setting, we're um, you know, happy with a perfectly competitive market generating a socially optimal outcome. And what we're assuming away in that whole process is the fact that um, in the real world, markets are the sum total of interactions between individual buyers and sellers. And that's, you know, across any market, if even in the labor markets, uh, the labor is selling their labor and their employer is uh, buying labor on the labor market. So um, what we end up having is, you know, any the, let's say now our supply and demand curves are kind of more granularly reflecting a collection of suppliers with increasing, each individual supplier has an increasing marginal cost of production and all of our buyers have a decreasing willingness to pay uh, for this, quant you know, for, for a unit of apples. Um, and in this case, we're just trying to figure out what is happening when two individuals, a buyer and a seller, are interacting in this market. And what happens if one seller refuses to interact with this buyer, you know, for whatever reason, this buyer has some characteristics that this seller doesn't like and they're, they're boycotting that person. 
in a perfect competition setting, we would expect, okay, free entry. There's clearly, if anyone else could generate an apple at a marginal cost of this level, they can make some money by selling an apple to this person because it's lower than their willingness to pay. So with free entry, you would expect someone who doesn't have a problem with this seller to say, hey, I, I got it, I'll, I'll sell to you. And whatever discrimination was there would be completely eliminated by perfect competition. As long as profits can be achieved, people will transact. And in the classical economic setting, uh, for, <laughs> for many years, this motivated uh, this result that, okay, if we can just focus on making markets as free and competitive as possible, um, we can eliminate discrimination. Uh, uh, you know, that's maybe an unfair uh, summarization of some of this early work on discrimination. Becker, 1957 book on uh, discrimination and comp competition is, um, you know, just calling into question what are the types of, uh, uh, what are the ways that the free market assumptions or the comp perfectly competitive market assumptions are violated that might drive discrimination? And is it sufficient just to work towards that free market? And in that, and, and if we can do that, then there's no need for government intervention to uh, manipulate how discrimination occurs. Obviously, just focusing completely on achieving a free market setting is, is not uh, that satisfying of a, of a result. Uh, first of all, because in reality, no markets are perfectly competitive and it's very difficult to achieve the kinds of assumptions uh, we need to assume under a free market, uh, competitive market setting. It just also doesn't answer a lot of other things we might be interested in uh, when we're trying to address discrimination or racial justice or environmental justice issues. Uh, that includes a lot of positive questions or trying to figure out what exactly is happening. Uh, so what, what departures from perfect competition are allowing for if we assume that that is actually a scenario that would eliminate discrimination? Uh, what are the departures from perfect competition that are allowing discrimination to occur? Uh, how exactly does racism or discrimination manifest and continue to occur in even in competitive markets? Can we identify how exactly that discrimination um, occurs? What are the impacts of racism and discrimination on individuals' welfare? How does over time can ongoing discrimination impact individuals? And also how does it impact uh, society as a whole? So that's just more descriptive questions, but we also want to know, well, what should we do about it? Are there policy interventions that we could undertake that would address discrimination conditional on how exactly that discrimination is happening and how might different policy interventions reduce discrimination and how much welfare improvement could we achieve through different policies? Uh, you know, all of this informing what should we do about this problem that we've identified. And economics is a really uh, useful set of tools that can help to answer a lot of these questions. Um, I wouldn't say that the field has always done a great job of answering these questions in good faith. Um, and in particular, it's been tough because economics has been dominated by uh, white men for centuries, uh, not to mention most of the rest of academia. Um, and so there's a lot of room for improvement in economics for including diverse perspectives. Um, and that's part of the reason why um, you're being encouraged to listen uh, to the perspective of several black economists uh, from those marketplace um, uh, spots that I've posted as part of this module. So we definitely wanna hear from people who have important perspectives on these issues and hopefully incorporate their research into the canon of academic economics.
And in particular, even a place like UC Davis um, suffers from uh, inequities and um, uh, unequal representation across different minorities in our uh, representation as we uh, get to higher levels in academia, um, the, the percentage gets lower and lower for uh, most minority groups, uh, except of course for, for white people, we have the highest representation at the highest um, levels of academia. Uh, and that makes it really difficult to incorporate diverse perspectives. There's this leaky pipeline in academia uh, that, uh, you know, we'll talk about some of the structural issues throughout our economy that uh, can result in some of these uh, inequitable outcomes. So it's so really important and, and hopefully, um, you know, getting folks thinking about, you know, do you want to go on in academia and how can we make academia a welcoming place for everybody who wants to participate. So for the rest of this lecture, we're going to talk about um, the structure of discrimination in a couple different settings. And we really want to understand the structure or the mechanisms for how discrimination is occurring. Uh, th that includes understanding possible mechanisms that we'll talk about, like pure discrimination, or maybe kind of what people would think the first thing that pops into their head when they're thinking of racism, uh, just people having preferences for people in their own racial group or ethnic group. Uh, it, but there's other possible mechanisms for how discrimination can occur. Uh, we'll think about issues like statistical discrimination, economic sorting, we'll talk more about what those things mean. But it's really important to understand those mechanisms because if we don't know how the discrimination is occurring or why, it's hard to structure policies that address the specific source of discrimination. So we'll talk a little bit more about um, unintended consequences of policies that are trying to reduce discrimination, but may actually end up having the opposite effect. So we can, if we can know where the discrimination is coming from, we can either say, okay, actually someone is breaking an existing law that we already have, like the Civil Rights Act, or maybe we need a new law to address the mechanism that we've identified um, and make sure that any new policies that we developed are well tailored to the source of discrimination. And uh, just to summarize, some of this might seem a little bit tangential to natural resource economics. Um, there, there is good literature on uh, a number of racial justice, social justice issues in economics. It's primarily focused around some of these topics, labor, wages, uh, disparities in access to housing, uh, education, health, and exposure to pollution. Uh, in, in recent years, there's been a lot more uh, research on police stops and uh, disparate levels of police violence in different communities. Um, so when I set out to try to make, uh, you know, set up some lectures on natural resources and environmental justice, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of trying to draw on some of these other literatures and make connections to concepts we've learned about in this class, uh, but it's not, you know, a perfect one-to-one -one <laughs> uh, discussion. So I'd love to hear from you guys, you know, if you've thought about this at all, what are some issues that you think uh, would be usefully incorporated into natural resource economics research and, you know, related to environmental justice. So I'll post a discussion question that um, I hope people will comment on uh, on Canvas. And just, uh, I think it's important to recognize that we care about these issues uh, for moral reasons, for ethical reasons, um, but surveys, uh, uh, including uh, a survey carried out by Maureen Cropper in 2016, uh, found that um, people are willing to pay for improvements in equity in our society. So this is just in the United States. Uh, she found that on average, the survey respondents were willing to accept a 22% increase in health risks, health risks to themselves if health risks were equalized in the rest of the population. So that's a pretty large increase in um, risks to yourself just to achieve 
um, better equity in in the population at large. Um, it's it's a it's they have less willingness to pay in terms of income for for income equity, but it's still uh, an, a, a, a sizable amount. Um, so so people really value making improvements on these issues. And as economists, we have a unique role in helping to craft the policies that can actually be successful in doing this. So I'm gonna stop and we'll come back to the next video where we'll talk about um, in a, per a particular setting in natural resource economics, which is land markets and equity.